everyone. I think we are going to get started. We have a fantastic group uh, gathered here tonight. Uh, my name is Mara Leff, um, and I am the Director of Innovation for the Jewish Healthcare Foundation, and I am proud to lead the Liftoff PGH team. Um, this is our first, in, uh, first event in our summer speaker series, um, and we are so excited to be partnering with Women in Bio um, and uh, have, have been privileged to partner with them throughout this initiative. Um, uh, I want to, before we jump into today's program, give you a little bit of information about, about us, about Liftoff, PGH, tell you a little bit more about the speaker series that we have planned for the summer, um, and then jump into our two absolutely wonderful presentations tonight. Um, so with that, I think I will get started. So. Let's see if I can advance the slides. So Liftoff PGH. Many of you, I see a lot of familiar names here in the participant list, but some uh, new friends as well. So I thought I would give you an update about this initiative um, and, and how it was how it was born and, and sort of what it's all about. So Liftoff um, is an event uh for sure but we like to say that it is also a movement for change it's also a launching pad for the pittsburgh region to become a hub and a, a proud center for healthcare and life sciences innovation um many of you who follow us know that the the event was initially planned for september 15th and 16th uh of 2020 but of course you know we went with the way of the world and had to adapt and pivot um, and so um, in light of, of, of the pandemic, we have pushed the dates back. I will be completely transparent. You know, we're looking at plans B, C, D, and E, uh, you know, just in case we're following the situation very closely, looking at various options, virtual options, in-person options, combination of, of the two. Um, bottom line is, you know, we're a healthcare foundation, Liftoff is is housed within the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. So our main priority is public health and safety, and we will um, be watching the situation very closely. We are, um, uh, I don't know if excited is the right word, but um, it's, it's, it's very interesting, the sort of new topics that have come to light during this pandemic that will be front and center at Liftoff as topic areas to explore together that were never on our radar before to include in a conference like this that, that have come to light. Um, you know, everything from contact tracing um, to agent-based modeling to uh, vaccine uh, discovery production, um, uh, you know, everything we're gonna talk about today and hear from our two fabulous speakers. These were topics that we were not originally planning on featuring, but are, of course, we're, we are, we're excited to be able to showcase some of the research and the innovative companies that are working on pandemic response and preparedness um, and you know, pivoting in really beautiful ways to to step up to the plate to to deal with something that um, that is truly in, unprecedented for for the world and for our region. Um, so you know, I, I would say follow along. We will keep everyone updated what the event looks like. Um, we are committed to having liftoff uh, PGH 2020 in 2020. Um, we say the journey of a thousand innovation begins with a single event. We hope that that is the case. We hope that it is a launching pad for for the region, um, no matter what iteration the event ends up taking place. A little bit of background of how we got here. So the Jewish Healthcare uh, Foundation is a nearly 30 year old institution um, housed right here in Pittsburgh. It was born out of the sale of Montefiore Hospital um, or what, what they call a conversion uh, foundation where the assets that were uh, in the hospital were transferred over into a, a public foundation to, uh, to push forward the original mission of the hospital, which was to improve public health and, uh, and safety. And um, we, we have been deeply involved in aging, women's health, HIV AIDS prevention and treatment. Um, and healthcare innovation, you know, over the past five, 10 years is, is a field that we felt we could not ignore these tectonic plates 
that were shifting in the industry and the role of technology and innovation in everything from healthcare delivery to research and discovery discovery and then, um, you know, uh, rolling, rolling out those discoveries into actual products and services. And so, you know, sort of our reaction to, to the changing world coupled with this report that some of our friends at other foundations in town commissioned with the Brookings Institute spurred the creation of Liftoff PGH. And, and at its core, this report looked at our innovation ecosystem broadly, not just the life sciences and healthcare sectors, but also our robotic sectors and our manufacturing se manufacturing sectors. And what it what it told us was pretty much at, you know, overall, but especially in the life sciences and, and healthcare spaces, is that we have tremendous assets in this region, but we're not always leveraging them and um, utilizing them to the best of their of their capabilities to really drive forward an innovation economy um, to attract new talent here to retain the incredible talent that comes out of our academic institutions to translate research into actual economic activity um, so on and so forth and i know i'm preaching to the choir so much here so many of you work on this and have worked on this for so long um, and so this report coupled with you know the trends that we were seeing in, in healthcare and these major changes that were coming we felt we couldn't ignore it and, and so lift off pgh is our is our response to help the, the community to help our region come together to work collaboratively collaboratively to push us forward um, partnerships are really at the core this webinar I think is a perfect example of what we're trying to to create with liftoff working with folks that are involved in the ecosystem that are already doing incredible work like like you know the folks you're going to hear from today uh, is essential we cannot do this alone this is this initiative is all about partnerships and collaboration uh, Jewish Healthcare Foundation we just sort of want to be the convening body the the, the central force that everyone can come around and we can help in, in any way that we can to drive that change forward um, a few components that I just briefly want to touch on we have a, a few components of the of liftoff that are um, really still moving forward this summer, despite all of the, of the changes and the disruptions um, in virtual ways. We have a, an idea-thon pitch competition where we're engaging students from around the region. Uh, very exciting. We just kicked off an entrepreneurship boot camp where we have uh, more than 30 students engaged from all, all the universities in town, all kinds of programs, learning about entrepreneurship, learning how to, to take their idea and get it off the ground. So really excited about that. And at the end of this, they will submit an idea to the pitch competition and then they will go through several rounds and then ultimately pitch live for the, for the money at liftoff. We're, we're still looking for judges. Please reach out if you'd be interested in being a judge in the competition, or if you know any students that would want to submit an idea Please, you know, at the end of this, reach out to us. We would love to partner with you. We would love to talk to you more about the initiative. Um, we have several um, other uh, speaker series already lined up and we'll continue to line them up for July and August. The next one is with Don Burke out of the Graduate School of Public Health. He's going to be talking about mapping a pandemic where he talks about his agent-based modeling work and his company epistemics that he has uh, spun out of, of the school. That's exciting. Please, please join us for that one. And then after that, we have uh, Gal Inbar, who's from Israel, who's working on some really interesting work, looking at Israel and Pittsburgh and trying to um, connect the two areas and, and push innovation forward and uh, bring companies in um, to, to, to have a home here in Pittsburgh um, to, you know, it, it, very interesting work. So please join us for that. And then look out for for others as we announce them in the coming weeks uh, for the rest of the summer. I, I'm going to turn it over now. I don't want to uh, take any more time. Please use the chat box. We, we will be doing some Q&A at the end. I encourage you to use the chat box. I encourage you, you know, to, to ask questions, comments. Um, and with that, I would love to turn it over to Kelly Piccione from, from Women in Bio, who's going to give some some updates and some information. So Kelly. Okay, thank you, Mara, for the introduction. Uh, Women in Bio is very excited to share this opportunity and this stage to spotlight these women who are making these innovations in health and life sciences. And so I will just give you a brief introduction of Women in Bio uh, or what we call WIB. Um, WIB was founded in 2002, and it's a national organization with 13 chapters in North America and growing. 
And our Pittsburgh chapter has been um, around since 2012. And we like to promote women, entrepreneurship, innovations, and that's what makes us a great fit um, to work with Liftoff. And so we offer various programming, educational programs, as well as social events, all with the intent to um, you know, help other women in the field of life sciences, to be um, someone to talk to, um, someone to bounce ideas off of, and stimulate um, learning. And so just wanted to highlight some of the programs that we have offered right now. Um, we have mentoring programs where members can participate as mentors or mentees or both. Um, the national organization offers a boardroom ready program, um, which has had tremendous success in both um, educating and promoting women onto corporate boards. Um, and I have this great opportunity to introduce you to um, another one of our with members, Advina Kitchington, and she's going to tell you more about our Young Women in Bio program, um, which is so important for you know taking everything we've learned and passing it on to the next generation. So that's um, my quick introduction. I'm going to leave my email in the chat. Um, if you want to reach out to learn more about WIB, um, just contact me, and I'll be happy to tell you more. Um, thank you very much. Hi everybody, thank you for, um, for allowing me to join you today. Um, as Mara mentioned, and of course, um, Kelly, my name is Edwina Kinchington, and I am a teacher actually at the Pittsburgh Science and Technology Academy. I did research for many years and then became a teacher, and I am chair of the Young Women in Bio Pittsburgh chapter, and I'm really glad to um, help, help just spread the word about Young Women in Bio. Uh, we're trying to, as Mara mentioned, create new talent in our community and, and um, bring up, uh, we have so many opportunities here in Pittsburgh. So who are we? Um, WIB, YWIB is a national organization, which is part of WIB. And our goal is to inspire our next generation. And we do this by sharing um, a passion of the WIB members in their scientific fields, providing some education and hands-on experiences in all areas of STEM, not just bio. So what are our goals? What are we trying to do? We're trying to promote diversity and inclusion for our next generation of female scientists in our community. Um, we try to provide um, engaging events throughout the year for both middle school and high school students. Uh, in all areas of STEM. Uh, and there are 13 different chapters around the, um, both in the United States and in Canada. And as I mentioned, um, again, it's, there are national initiatives as well as local initiatives. And we partner with Pitt, of course, and CMU, our local universities, um, the hospitals and um, our, our leading companies. Some of the initiatives are to generate leadership opportunities for students. So YWIB National has just made, created a YWIB Ambassadors Program. Um, and that's, a, that's both for each chapter and nationally. Uh, YWIB also has started a YouTube channel, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in, members from all over the country have created educational modules about COVID-19. Uh, why would Pittsburgh just recently provided a life skills professional webinar with Dr. Crystal Morrison, Morrison for our students um, as these teenagers are embarking on those next steps. And we also have um, this year worked with Innovation Works about entrepreneurship and bear radiology, um, looking at what um, jobs and technologies are utilized in STEM. So just this gives you an idea of what type of partnerships we're doing here in the community. And um, why I'm here and what, I, what we're really trying to encourage uh, as one of our initiatives is to really get the word out about Young Women in Bio. I need you all uh, to help spread the word to our communities, to family members, to teachers, um, maybe to your own children and their schools um, so that they can learn about Young Women in Bio and start participating. Um, it's, it's always t a little hard sometimes for teachers to, to um, take that initiative. Uh, if you know of individuals or organizations interested in helping young women in bio, either through volunteering or providing um, or hosting an event or being a mentor, please um, reach out, uh, pittsburghywib at womeninbio.org. And I am I'm looking forward to hearing more about, from our speakers and um, 
please um, spread the word about Young Women in Bio. We're very fortunate to be in a wonderful community and we want to help generate that next generation of young female scientists um, with what we have to offer. So thank you very much. Fabulous. Thank you, Edwina. I really appreciate it. That's wonderful and, and very lucky to have that resource for young women. Um, and thank you again for being with us. So while Amy gets her slides up, I will quickly introduce her. Um, we are very excited to, uh, as our first speaker to have Dr. Amy Hartman with us. Uh, Dr. Hartman has a, a primary faculty appointment in the Department of Infectious Disease and Microbiology uh, at the Graduate School of Public Health. Um, prior to that, she did her postdoctoral fellowship in special pathogens at CDC. She, uh, while she was at CDC, she was a member of the outbreak response team that was sent to Angola in 2005 during the largest recorded outbreak of Marburg hemorrhagic fever. Um, and she has also worked on uh, the Ebola virus, uh, Zaire virus. We are so excited to have you here to hear what you've been working on. So I will turn it over to Dr. Hartman. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully you all can see my slides and you can hear me okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, and for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here to tell you all a little bit about um, sort of my career in emerging viruses um, and, and where I've kind of come from and where I hope, I hope to be going. And I call it the road less traveled because it's, I've definitely taken um, a winding uh, route to where I am and not, not the standard um, direct route to um, a faculty position at a university like Pitt. Um, and as we all know, with COVID-19, emerging viruses are all of a sudden in the news. Um, and so for those of us that have been studying emerging viruses for a long time, that is both puzzling and intriguing and kind of just uh, amazing to kind of to watch this whole thing unfold in public in real time um, on a virus um, that is similar to the ones that we've been studying for a long time. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about... Um, what, uh, what I do in my work, um, and I'm currently in the Center for Vaccine Research at Pitt. Uh, so uh, just talk a little bit about my career history, because um, we are in Pittsburgh. I'm a native Pittsburgher. Um, I went to Woodland Hills High School. There's not a lot of, I, I like to say that because I think it, it gives, you know, people in the Pittsburgh area, especially young women, like a reason to think that they can kind of grow up and, 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 and do do fun things, you know, even coming from Pittsburgh, which is, a, you know, a small city. So I am um, a native Pittsburgher. Um, and I did my undergraduate at Washington and Jefferson College, um, where I was a biology major. Um, and after I graduated from that, I came to Pitt. And so I had never intended to stay in the Pittsburgh region for all of my education. But it just sort of worked out that way. And when I, when I was looking for colleges and graduate schools, these were the best fit for me. So um, I came to, to Pitt um, and I got my PhD in molecular virology through the interdisciplinary program in the School of Medicine. Um, after I graduated uh, from there, then I went to the CDC in Atlanta uh, where I stayed for about five or six years as a postdoctoral fellow. I'll tell you a little bit more about my time there in a minute. And then after um, completing my postdoc at CDC, I returned back to the University of Pittsburgh. Um, again, like this wasn't all planned out, but it's, it's worked out really, really well. And at Pitt, I have a, a faculty position in public health, as well as in the Center for Vaccine Research. So to tell you a little bit about my, my postdoctoral fellowship um, in Atlanta, you know, it was my, my sort of goal after graduating uh, with my PhD from Pitt, I wanted to go to the CDC in Atlanta and work for the government and work in the high containment lab, which is the biosafety level four, also called the hot zone. You can see the pictures here. And the special pathogens branch is the part of the CDC that studies emerging viruses that are uh, very deadly to humans in which there's no vaccine or therapeutic. So the ones listed um, in this table in the middle, uh, including Ebola virus. And so, um, so I, I went to the CDC and obtained a, a fellowship uh, and was trained to work in the biosafety level four. 
And for my time there, I did um, a, my research project was on Ebola virus, trying to understand how it can inhibit the immune response and basically trying to figure out why it's such a deadly virus. It's because it can inhibit the immune response um, really well. And so I spent my time um, conducting basic research uh, in that area. Um, but then as Mara mentioned in the intro, I also had a chance to, um, to go to Africa and participate in an outbreak response team. Um, so this was in 2005. And um, there was an outbreak of Marburg hemorrhagic fever in Angola, which is the country here on the west coast of Africa. And Marburg hemorrhagic fever is basically a cousin of Ebola. It causes a very similar disease, it just has a different name. Um, and so we were sent as a team of um, scientists, and, and CDC does this uh, for many, many types of outbreaks across the world. They send teams of scientists into the area um, to help um, both diagnose patients as well as take care of patients. And so um, since I, was, I am a scientist by training, um, I was involved in the diagnostic portion. And so we set up a um, uh, makeshift sort of, you know, um, it, it's not, not similar to the labs we have here, but um, it was a lab where we could safely work with patient samples and diagnose them and uh, test them for Marburg virus. Um, and so that's some of the pictures that I've shown here. There was an area of the lab that we called the hot lab where we had to wear personal protective equipment as shown here to enter. And that's a picture of me sitting um, at the biosafety cabinet um, working with patient samples. We then were able to bring them out of the hot lab and process them and extract nucleic acids in the main lab. So this was a, um, an experience in public health that I really, really value um, to this day, kind of giving me some real world experience away from the bench um, and, and uh, learning what it's like, like um, to, to run um, a scientific lab uh, in Africa. And so then um, in 2008, I returned back to Pitt um, through... Um, through some um, serendipity, a, a, a job opening came up at Pitt um, uh, to take an administrative position in the Center for Vaccine Research. So at that time, um, the uh, what we call the Regional Biocontainment Laboratory, or RBL, was under construction. And the RBL is a large biosafety level three facility. So it's not a facility you can work with Ebola. It's one step down from that, but but you can still work with pathogens like SARS-CoV, which causes COVID-19. Um, so this lab was under construction, and because of my experience um, at the CDC working with Ebola, um, I was a good fit for this administrative position to basically be part of the team that was getting this high containment lab up and running. Okay, so I, and at that time, you know, in my career, I had just had um, my first child who was less than a year old, um, and I wasn't sure that like the, the academic route uh, for uh, research was for me. I thought this administrative position would, would be a good, um, a good fit, and it was. So um, for five years, I worked um, as the research manager of this facility and helped to, to um, get it open from the ground up. And we established all the protocols and procedures that are still in use today. Um, and then around 2013 or 20 to 14 to present, I transitioned away from an administrative role into um, a, a basic research role. And now I run my own independent research lab. Um, and this whole time, I've always been interested in emerging viruses. And one of the viruses that I focus on is a virus called Rift Valley Fever, which I'm sure none of you have ever heard of, which is a good thing, right? You never heard of coronavirus until... COVID-19 happened. Um, but you, you've not heard of Rift Valley fever virus. It's primarily um, found in Africa, but it is an emerging virus that's of, of significant concern. Um, so um, in, for the past six years, I've been running my own research laboratory. This is the type of um, protective equipment we wear in a biosafety level three lab. Um, so it's different than the level four, um, but we have been um, especially in the past four months, transitioning a lot of our work over to COVID-19, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. And so the, the virus I said I study um, was Rift Valley fever. And if you look at um, this slide here, so this slide was made, of course, pre-COVID-19. 
and the WHO periodically puts out this blueprint of priori priority diseases. These are the emerging diseases that the WHO feels are the most critical to study and try to develop vaccines for. And so you may recognize some of the names on here, but on here is disease X, and that is now you know, uh, SARS-CoV-2, the causative agent of COVID-19, and there are many other potential viruses out there. But I've been studying this one called Rift Valley Fever for a number of years, um, and, and I just have like a couple slides to introduce what this virus is to all of you, um, because you've heard, you've heard about COVID-19, about how it probably originated in bats or some sort of animal that we don't really know yet. Um, so when a virus goes from animals to people, that's called a zoonotic transmission. Um, and um, zoonotic diseases are very, very interesting to me. Uh, how they are able to jump from animal species into people is just very fascinating. And Rift Valley Fever is a zoonotic disease. It's actually a disease of animals, of livestock. The livestock get very, very sick when they're infected with this virus. And then the farmers and herdsmen that work with the livestock get exposed and they get very sick as well. And so this virus can have a number of out, um, disease outcomes in humans. Um, and so my lab spends a lot of time studying this virus, trying to figure out how does it cause disease and how can we prevent it with vaccines or therapeutics. So um, to kind of talk a little bit more broadly about what we do at Pitt in the Center for Vaccine Research, because I'm one researcher in this center, um, and there's about 15 of us, and we all work on some aspect of emerging infectious diseases. So I wanted to give you a flavor of what, what kind of um, infrastructure Pitt has uh, for studying this virus. And interestingly, your speaker next week, Dr. Don Burke, um, uh, he was the original um, director of the Center for Vaccine Research when we first opened in 2007. And he was the one that recruited me here back to Pitt um, in 2008. So um, Don and I uh, go way back. Um, he has since transitioned into other roles in the School of Public Health, and we have a new director, um, Dr. Paul Dupre. But we are a group of infectious disease experts. The things that interest us are emerging infectious diseases, some of which are listed on here. Um, and SARS-CoV-2, as we know, came out, um, uh, emerged in the region of China. And so the center, we serve as a hub for studying these viruses. Some of them are bacteria as well, but we, we study these pathogens and we try to develop preclinical interventions. So we try to understand pathogenesis, which is how, pa how pathogens cause disease. We try to develop interventions like vaccines and therapeutics. And we, we do this with a focus on emerging diseases that are of global importance. Um, and so, and why are we here? You may be asking yourself, why is there this center at Pitt? And why is there this high containment lab that works with dangerous pathogens at Pitt? Um, and the, we are here because um, as a response to the um, terrorist attacks of 9-11 and then the subsequent anthrax bioterrorism that month later, um, the, um, the NIH funded the construction of a number of different regional biocontainment labs, labs of which we are just one of them. Um, to, and the goal was to enhance the, our nation's infrastructure for being able to work with these pathogens, right? We can't study them and understand them if we don't have facilities that can work with them safely. So part of this, part of this uh, response was building up the national infrastructure. And the Pitt Regional Biocontainment Lab opened in 2008. We've been working safely with these pathogens for over 10 years in high containment. And so we really want to connect the basic research with animal models for evaluation of vaccines and therapeutics. And we're actually mandated to assist in the event of natural outbreaks where we find ourselves now. So what are we doing? Like, what are we doing now in real time? Um, we're prepared to assist with the local public health response. We, as, as faculty in the center, provide subject matter experts talking to groups like yours. A um, number of us have been interviewed in media recently. We provide um, advice and expertise in areas like animal models and vaccine testing. And we do public outreach as well. 
And so what we have spent most of our time doing in the past four months is responding to COVID-19. And so um, at the end of January, um, our director, Dr. Paul Dupre, formed a task force of five faculty members, of which I'm one of them. And we each tackled different areas. We were able to um, obtain, if you saw in the news at the time, um, it, it was in the news, um, Dr. Dupre um, announcing that uh, the Pitt Center for Vaccine Research was obtaining an isolate of SARS-CoV-2 from both the CDC in Atlanta, as well as a colleague in um, Munich, Germany. And so we received that isolate on February 14th. And then we have been full steam ahead, developing um, animal several different novel animal models for understanding how the virus causes disease. And we're getting ready to start testing candidate vaccines in the animals. And so this is some of the data that we generated in this amount of time. Um, this brightly colored picture here on the left um, represents um, virus infected cells in culture. So SARS-CoV-2, virus infecting cells in culture. This is a plaque assay, which is how we, we measure the amount of virus in a sample. These are some um, PET CT images. You may, you may recognize this from some human clinical um, imaging studies. This, these are some of the images that we obtained from our animals on study and some data that, that, that shows that SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted through um, swabs, either nasal, oral, rectal, or conjunctival, um, the virus can be shed through these swabs um, after infection. And so we're working now on wrapping up our initial study and submitting it for publication and then working on our um, vaccine um, our vaccine study. So if you wanna find out more about what we do, please visit um, the center's website, as well as my lab's website, and um, it's been a pleasure talking to you all. I'm happy to answer any questions about what I, my lab does or what the center does in general. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. I think we're gonna pause for questions at the end and we'll do questions overall okay. if that's okay, but thank sure. you so much, that was awesome. Um, next, we'll bring up our next speaker, uh, Liz Caselitz. She has spent the last 10 years working as a research project manager for the University of Michigan Medical School. She began working on a telehealth and depression study uh, in 2010 after completing her master's in social work. And uh, she's been working on a number of really exciting and innovative research pro uh, projects ever since. Over the last five years, uh, she has uh, really honed her passion for maternal and neonatal health research and most recently has focused her efforts on the influence of COVID-19 um, on anxiety levels of pregnant women. Um, and that's what she's going to tell us a little bit more about tonight. So Liz, welcome, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, thank you so much to Liftoff PGH and Women in Bio for having me, and Dr. Hartman, what an amazing presentation. Um, so as Mara said, my plan is to talk to you about some interesting work that we've been doing related to pregnancy and COVID-19. Um, and more specifically, pregnancy and anxiety related to COVID-19. Um, before I jump into that, though, I am going to say a little bit more about my background. So I am a senior project manager at U of M, um, and I've been there for 10 years. However, I do live and work in this beautiful city. So I, I live and work here in Pittsburgh, um, and I've been here for four years now. Um, I have worked in a number of projects related to health and human rights, telehealth and depression. Um, I was a, a communications manager for a while for a large research group, helping to translate uh, research findings into terms and ideas that made sense to people outside of the research world. Um, and then five years ago, I landed in the Preventing Maternal and Neonatal Death Study in rural Northern Ghana. And that is where my love for maternal and neonatal health research began. Um, I could talk about that study all night long. It is really multifaceted and interesting. Um, a few quick pieces are that we really examined the non-clinical factors that lead to death or near death of moms and babies in four rural districts. Um, for near death, we classify that as a near miss. 
Um, so what is a non-clinical factor? Uh, that can look like distance to facility, condition of roads to get to facility, uh, facilities, and a big thing is women's autonomy. So how much do women have the ability within their communities to actually seek care um, or do they need permission? And then what is the influence of having the strongest voice in care seeking decisions for yourself or your baby? Um, how does that influence outcomes? So that's what I'll say about PERMAN for now, but um, that is what has kind of led us into this COVID-related research um, for moms and babies. The last thing I will say about me is I am a mom to three kids under the age of six. Why is that relevant in a professional talk? Um, because I will talk anywhere about the importance of being creative and supportive of moms who want to have it all while they're also often doing it all. Um, and this was an example of my team being creative and supportive with me when they said, yeah, sure, you should bring your newborn with all of us to Ghana um, to travel all around. Uh, so I, I'm a big proponent of that, of, of supporting women in any way we can to keep them in the workforce if they wanna be there. Okay, so what did we do related to pregnancy and COVID-19? Before I delve into this, I'm going to ask that um, everybody close their eyes for a minute. And I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about where you were exactly when you found out that your state had issued the stay at home order. Where were you, who told you, kind of try and put yourself back in that position. And then try and think about how you felt. Were you scared? Were you nervous? Um, where did you feel like your level of information was? relative to your level of fear. Try and put yourself back there and then try and imagine that at that same time, you're also pregnant. So you're worried about yourself, you're worried about keeping yourself safe, but then you're also worried about your baby and you're worried about having enough knowledge to know how to keep your baby safe. Um, so you can open your eyes now. But that exercise was to try to transplant you back to that time um, because Things are changing so rapidly with COVID-19, but that is the exact time when we launched this survey. So on April 3rd, right after 38 states had started their stay-at-home order, is when we launched a brief anonymous online survey of pregnant women. And the survey had no geographical bounds. Anybody in the world could answer these questions. Um, and this survey took flight. I mean, as someone who has worked in research for a long time and is very accustomed to the kind of push and pull of trying to get people involved in your research and trying to get them to do your surveys and to be participants, I mean, it needed almost nothing. People jumped on board and spread it like wildfire. Um, and they spread it to the point that they made their own graphics. Like we found these online, this was not our team. People shared our survey and then they made it even prettier than what we had done. Um, so the survey took flight and grew its own legs and we kind of didn't understand it until we started to get feedback. Uh, we heard that women felt really scared and really alone. They didn't think anybody was paying attention to this and they didn't realize that, you know, they do have a unique situation with being pregnant during this situation. Um, and, and they thought they were alone on an island of, of fear. So one person actually said, I felt like it was my therapy for the day, taking an online anonymous survey. Um, so before I, I jump into exactly what we asked and what our findings were, I want to preface it by saying that uh, this information has not yet been peer reviewed. So anybody who's not in the scientific field what that means is um, when you submit a paper for publication, a, a review board of your peers will look at it and make sure it's scientifically rigorous. That has not happened for us yet. We have submitted it and have not heard back. So I'm going to call this preliminary data and I'm going to keep kind of a, a bird's eye view of how we gathered the data and um, how we analyzed it for now. I'll be happy to share the findings as soon as they're published in a more detailed manner. Um, so what did we ask? We asked a series of demographic questions. Who are these women? Where are they from? And where are they at in their pregnancies? 
Um, and we asked a series of health-related and pregnancy-related factors. So what health issues did you have before you got pregnant, um, physical and mental health? And then what issues did you have when you got pregnant? So what were you diagnosed with during pregnancy, including any mental health issues? Um, and we asked a series of healthcare utilization factors. So um, how has your prenatal care changed because of COVID? Has it changed at all? And how have your plans um, for your, your birth potentially changed because of the virus? Uh, so who did we hear from? We heard from 4,200 people from 21 countries and 47 states. And we heard from them very quickly. Um, we kept the survey open for three weeks, but the bulk of our responses were, were very, very quickly. Um, of those, we had 2,740 respondents from the U.S. who completed the survey in its entirety. So that's the group that I'm going to tell you a little bit more of um, or more about because th that's the group that we've really analyzed at this point. We do plan to do further analysis, um, including analysis on the 333 respondents with complete surveys from outside of the United States. Um, the bulk of which were from westernized countries, including Norway, Canada, and Australia. Um, so who are these women? A few things I want to point out here. The vast majority of the women were white, and 50% um, were college graduates or less. So that means that 50% had a master's degree or more. So it was a very white and a very educated sample not representative of the U.S. at large, but it was just a sample that we received in, in a very quick time frame. I just wanted to point that out. Um, it also was a sample that had 36% um, had a, a previous mental health diagnosis, and um, the vast majority were married. Um, so what has COVID-19 meant for women's care? Um, a few things I want to point out here are that more than a quarter of women had stopped in-person visits for their prenatal care. Um, for anyone who has not attended a prenatal visit, there's a lot of, there's a very physical aspect to it, right? There is taking your blood pressure, there is listening to your baby's heartbeat on a Doppler machine, measuring your belly. There's a very physical aspect to it that um, if you weren't to have that, you know, there may be a lack of reassurance there because it is one thing to have the doctor look at you, hear your baby, touch your belly and say, you're okay. Um, so a quarter of women did not have that during this time. Um, and I also want to point out that 96% of the sample had planned to deliver in a hospital before COVID and that dropped to 87% during COVID. So a number of women moved away from a hospital delivery. Um, so how did we analyze anxiety? We used a validated measure. It's called the PRAS. It's the Pregnancy-Related Anxiety Scale. Um, you can get a score of 8 to 40. 40 is high anxiety. 8 is the lowest you could have. Um, and the PRAS asks a series of questions. Here's two examples of those. Um, I am confident of having a normal childbirth, and I have a lot of fear regarding the health of my baby. Those are two examples of things asked about the press or asked in the press to measure anxiety, uh, and we found that on average, women had a four points higher score from their assessment of their anxiety before COVID versus during COVID. So, what are women worried about? Uh, Sixty percent of the sample had fear of food running out or not being available, and we read that and thought wow, that is a huge number, until we thought about this. Until we remembered that at that time that we administered this survey, this is what the grocery store looked like. People were scared and they were taking more than their share and you know there was a lot of fear about shortages. Uh, so we also found out that over 60% were afraid of losing their job or losing their family income. More than half had concerns about childcare Nearly 40% had stress about increased conflict in their homes, and the vast majority 
uh, were afraid for themselves, their baby, or their family of getting infected with COVID. So after analysis, what factors are driving the biggest changes in pregnancy-related anxiety? So after controlling for a number of factors statistically, we found that women who had stopped that face-to-face -face prenatal visit and women who had changed their birth plan away from a hospital had significantly greater changes in their pregnancy-related anxiety than those who didn't. Furthermore, those who had the most stress about COVID-related factors had the greatest changes in their pregnancy-related anxiety. So what does that mean? It means that COVID-related anxiety and stressors are clearly negatively impacting pregnancy-related anxiety. They're making women feel like their pregnancies are gonna be less safe. Um, so a few qualitative examples here to kind of drive some of these points home. Um, one woman said, on top of us losing our jobs and having no income right before a new baby, it's like our world is ending before it's supposed to be a new beginning. Uh, another woman said, the thought of even walking into a hospital feels like I'm purposefully walking into a fire. And then you want me to bring my newborn child into that? I'm supposed to protect my baby. And the idea of delivering in a hospital with the chance of not having my husband allowed has shattered me. I've cried every day for weeks about it. I've had constant nightmares. I've never felt so stressed. Um, two more examples here. This woman talks about deciding to leave her ob practice and have a home birth because she will not subject herself to oppressive hospital protocols in which she has to risk birthing alone or having to wear a face mask while struggling through labor and possibly being medically bullied, as she calls it, into being separated from her infant if she tests positive for COVID-19. Lastly, a woman said, my provider has changed three times. I can't get clear answers about what to expect at delivery. My breastfeeding and birthing courses were canceled with no alternatives offered, and my hospital tour was canceled and no information was provided. So she had all her ducks in a row, she had all her planning ready, and then poof, it was all gone, and there was nothing put in place of that, and no information. Um, so what did we take away as our biggest takeaways from this study, and kind of what can we do now? Uh, pregnant women are anxious, and that in itself is not, you know, an earth-shattering concept. Everybody's kind of anxious at this point, but the fact that their anxiety about COVID-related stressors is making them more anxious about their pregnancies is worrisome and something that we need to think about. Um, also, face-to-face -face visits for women are, are being stopped right when women need support the most because they are the most anxious right now and they're the most worried about their pregnancies. Um, and, and again, this was done at the time when, when fear was very high, right? And the policies were not as clear. Um, they're probably clearer now hospitals that kind of have their feet under them now and they, they know what they're doing. But then what happens if the next wave looks a little bit different? Um, and then what happens at the next epidemic or pandemic? How can we plan now to better support women in the future when things change really rapidly so they don't feel like they're on this island alone? And so their biggest source of support is not an anonymous online survey. Okay, thank you so much, and I welcome you know any questions. Um, please reach out to me now or later. There's my email. Okay, address. thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, so we have had a few questions. So um, if Amy and Liz, if you can both unmute your lines, I will start with the first question. We had two questions um, about the uh, where we are in the development of the vaccine. Uh, can you shed some light on sort of um, where you are in, in that. Sure, I mean, um, I can talk broadly about where the medical community is with development of vaccine. And um, typically vaccine development takes years, meaning 10 years to develop a vaccine from the concept all the way to production and um, you know, injection into people. So it is very long and very complicated for a lot of different reasons um, that, that I'm not going to get into, but it, it is a long process. 
And so the um, sort of compressed time frame for development of a COVID-19 vaccine, everybody is saying 18 months, which would be light speed if it were to actually happen in 18 months. Um, everything has been moving very, very quickly. The thing is about um, COVID-19 is that the virus is um, an enigma, okay? And it's, so it is quite different from other coronaviruses that we know, it's different from influenza. So there's a lot we don't know about it. And so my concern is that we rush into a vaccine too quickly um, without making sure that all of the ducks are in a row with regards to testing it in animals, both for safety and efficacy. So does it work? Can it protect animals from COVID infection and COVID disease? And then moving on to to well-controlled, um, thorough human clinical trials. So all of that needs to be done before um, we can have a vaccine for people. And that's just going to take time. Um, there's a number of promising candidates that are in development, but like I said, this virus is an enigma and there's a, still a lot we don't know about how it causes disease in people that we really need to understand before a vaccine can move, move forward completely. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one is for Liz. Do you intend to get responses from a more diverse population? Why do you think that the majority of the answers were in the US came from white women? Um, do you wonder if the concern was uh, maybe that there weren't enough um, representation from other racial groups and that that could you know, affect factors? Great question. Um, we do plan to release a postnatal survey at some point, and we would love to try and do more outreach um, to reach a more diverse population. Uh, we did end up controlling for race in our statistics. Um, so I, I don't know that it influenced the final factors, um, but I, I think that we, I think that's a great point. We would love to have a more diverse sample for our next survey. Great, and the next one was also, also for you, Liz. Were you able to look at correlations associated with other complications during pregnancy? And then the secondary piece was, are there any tools targeted towards pregnant women to address this elevated anxiety? So any, um, any work that's been done to address your findings in real time that you know of? Um, so I am going to leave question one. <laughs> I, I would love for my team to answer that. I wish they were sitting here with me. As far as I know, there were no other correlations that were examined in our analysis. Um, as far as question two, not that I know of either. You know, I, I think this is a space where the health systems need to step up more than patients individually. Um, I think it's a space where, where the health systems need to reach out with resources available to patients and not for patients to try it and, and find their own resources. Absolutely. Um, more for Liz, a lot of interest in pregnancy and, and women, uh, I love it. Um, did your study address whether anxiety was negatively impacting other medical conditions like blood pressure or pregnancy related conditions? I, I don't believe so, no. But I love these questions, keep them coming. <laughs> Good, and we're recording them, so you'll have them all too if you wanna get back to folks. We're happy to push out answers too over our platforms. Um, and then there's also a, a question, and, and I would also, you know, in the last several minutes that we have together, if anyone else wants to chime in about things that they've heard or working on, um, you know, in relation to any of this work, um, any advice or recommendations for women who wanna get pregnant right now? Um, you know, I, you. It's a, that's a really great question. I am not a clinician, um, so that is one that I am going to try not to answer at this point also. But that is a great question, one that we have heard from a number of women. Sure. Amy, uh, we'll do a few more and then we'll be mindful of time because it's also dinner time, I think. Uh, do you think that we can really anticipate a future pandemic with the resources that we have at our disposal today? Uh, that is a good question. And uh, what I hope um, something good that comes out of this pandemic is that we as a society, a global society, realize that investing in public health infrastructure, investing in basic research um, is critical, right? Because the public health infrastructure in this country has been decimated for many, many years, 30, 40 years. 
Um, so we, we haven't had the structure in place, right? The, the contact tracers, uh, the epidemiologists, um, the public health network, for instance, like Allegheny County Health Department, you know, there's three people there, you know, there, it's, it's, it, there's not very many people. CDC itself, I mean, I, my, my good friend still work, works at CDC and is in the branch that, that deals with SARS-CoV-2 and when the outbreak happened, she was one of five people that did the diagnostics. So diagnostics from all over the world, samples were coming in and it was, it fell to five people to, to run that. So what, that's what I mean, like we need more investment and I, and I hope that that's one of the good things that can come from it and a general, more, a general awareness of, okay, emerging infectious diseases are important. They're important to study and they're important to learn and understand. We'll end on this one because I really like it because I also think the question embodies the spirit of liftoff, which is collaboration and working together. Do you two think, in your opinions, we'll start with we'll start with you, Liz, um, that there has been increased collaboration among the research community during COVID, um, and sort of what is your take on that? Um, I think absolutely. Uh, we actually immediately put together a, a task force at U of M surrounding COVID nineteen and pregnancy. And all of these women came together and all of these voices came together to try and support each other and to try and move forward the knowledge. Um, so absolutely, I think collaboration is up during this time. Okay. And yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think the scientific community has really come together in a collaborative way to respond to COVID-19. For example, um, I am part of two different working groups one with the World Health Organization, where once a week, scientists from all over the world get together for a conference call to present real-time data on what they're doing. I'm in part, a part of another a working group, also more uh, localized in the United States. So everybody's trying to share data, share information in real time, post it on um, uh, preprint servers and things like that. that. That's completely new for this, this pandemic. That's fantastic. And so I just... We, I feel like we could go on all night, but we'll be respectful of everyone's time. And I know it's dinner time. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for joining us for our first event in our series uh, that we have launched uh, post-COVID. Uh, Wib, thank you so much uh, for being a fantastic partner. Women in Bio is a, really a fantastic organization. I recommend uh, reaching out and hearing more about what what their members uh, work on. Like I mentioned, these are our next two scheduled uh, events. Please register if you go to liftoffpgh.org backslash speaker series. You can see the links there. Uh, please join us.